three, two, one. And we are live! <laughs> Greetings and salutations and welcome to the dance party! Um, today we have a very special stream, of course, because we have a very special guest. Kaora, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you, Janet? Whoop, whoop. I'm doing good. I can hear myself echoing from somewhere, which is a little bit alarming, but um, we'll figure out what that is, I am sure. And uh, today we have a very special topic, don't we? What are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about taverns today. Taverns, yeah. not just taverns, of course, tabled battle maps. And that is because of this guy right here. You should be able to see our tavern challenge is, of course, in full swing. We have videos coming out on our YouTube channel about tavern music and about how to make a great tavern. So if you're taking part in the challenge, make sure you go and check those out. But of course, today we are talking about tavern maps. My guess is at this point, you've created a little bit of your tavern and um, you're starting to think about like doing a layout and, and, and thinking about like really showcasing how it looks in different ways. And who better, who freaking better to ask questions from than the, sorry, the Kaora, the actual the Kaora, who is an internationally renowned illustrator and fantasy photographer who has worked with, among others, the Critical Role franchise, who holds a degree in game design, is an active tabletop RPG game master, a pro, a pro D&D &D streamer, having performed two seasons of the official Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons show with yours truly. That, tell me, tell me truly, was that the highlight of your career, Kaora? Yes, was, sorry, yeah. whiplash from all those things. <laughs> all the things, yes. Oh, 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 oh yes, I remember doing that. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, playing with you, Janet, it was, it was one of the highlights of my life, not just, you know, my recent tabletop uh, RPG career. It was uh, oh. a wonderful experience. You know all the right things to say. Yes. Um, I'm romancing my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that was the voice of the producer, everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Demi. <laughs> So if you want to learn more about Kira's maps, illustrations, and TTRPG settings, or just go, oh, pretty, then you can do that at kira.com, or you can go check out his Patreon. Um, and uh, even more than that, we've got a raffle today. Kira, tell us what you're raffling off. Well, considering the fact that you're doing a lovely talk about taverns, I thought it would be an awesome idea to raffle off some of the taverny assets that I have. So we're going to be raffling off the... Uh, the furniture assets, the rustic furniture assets, one rustic. and two. Uh, so all of the stuff that you might need to build your own tavern for your whoop, battle maps. Whoop. So one lucky winner will win their own tavern paraphernalia to make their own tavern map. Oh yeah, exclamation point raffle to take part in that. And we will be calling that at the end of the stream. So make sure you stick around to claim your prize. And uh, yeah, make sure that you ask your questions from mm. Kaora. If you've tried a tavern map and you've run into trouble, if you haven't started a tavern map, then honestly ask the freaking master. That is what we dragged him on the live stream for. I just dragged. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! <laughs> Yeah, That's kind of how it happened. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we, we promised him D and D. Don't worry. It's, it's yeah, gonna happen. yeah, yeah, yeah. More giant to... lizards. Mm. I miss yes. those lizards. Oh, the little geckos. Yeah. Oh, bless them. We should They're stop doing that. <laughs> we played an RPG campaign. It had giant lizards that walked through the swamp like this, and they made the little whoop, whoop. those little noises. Whoop, whoop. Anyway, anyway, we should we should work, Kaora. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, what are we doing? Oh yes, we're streaming. Uh. That's right, we're not making stupid noises to each other. <laughs> the big Chris has written in the chat, I miss them too. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we should get on. We should start yes. with our topic of the week, which is of course D&D &D taverns. So D&D &D tavern maps, really popular, but they can be really hard to get right. So where do you start when divide? I'm sorry, I was possessed with the spirit of a lizard. Where do you start when designing a tavern map? Oh God, where to begin? So I think um, we should probably start this to topic off by saying that taverns are super useful, right? Yeah. I think everybody can agree that taverns in a game of D and D are amazing. I mean, you can start in a tavern, pretty much. It sorts out your game you can bring in npcs it has gossip it has different like you know the, the right ambience for like a fantasy sort of vibe you know it's got that kind of tropiness to it so people know what they're doing and where they are it's great um so obviously 
you're going to want a tavern most of the time in your D&D campaign. And that means that you probably want to have like a map of one or you want to have some kind of space to sort of work out, you know, where things are and what things do. So with that in mind, you kind of have to, I guess, understand what's in a tavern and what makes a good tavern, right? Like the vibe as well as like what's in it. So things like the bar where you might have selling drinks there might be a bartender or, or you know somebody like that sells you things um and then you can have tables you can sit down at you can have npcs at that are also there or like customers and other villagers or city people that are like chatting about things that are happening in the area all of these things are like critical to our idea of a tavern so when you're designing a map that's the first thing that I can think of is you have to think what makes a tavern? What are the critical elements you can place in that tavern? And then that's going to sort you out for basically the idea. Uh, and then you have to dive down and get into the nitty gritty. And I guess um, that really depends what you're using the tavern for as well. If it's a place that your mm. players are starting in, that's going to be different than if you're planning them for, to have a brawl in the middle of your campaign, right? That's going mm -hmm. to be different than if you're sending them there to interrogate an NPC or search mm -hmm. for some hidden treasure or, I don't know, pull some things off a quest board and, uh, well, the players will probably eat them. But you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it never goes well if you give them something just so simple. They're just like, oh, it must be a mimic. Kill it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think I think that's true. And I think another thing that probably we should touch upon slightly is the fact that, you know, taverns are, you know, they're great. And I think that for the most part, almost every campaign is going to have a tavern, multiple taverns of many different kinds, all for many different purposes. Yeah. Um, but obviously a tavern is a tavern. And, and for some reason, it's got that kind of negative tropiness that, oh, you know, you're playing D&D, you're starting a tavern. It's like... No, it's, it's really useful, actually. It's just how you do it and putting your own spin on it and making it like unique and a little bit more like it fits with whatever sort of campaign you're running. You don't just slap in a, a typical medieval tavern most of the time. You have to think about what it's going to be used for. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really that's really important. So actually, that brings me to my next question, which is how do you make your taverns and how do you make your tavern maps feel distinct from one another? You mentioned mm. bringing in multiple taverns. It's a great way to do. It's a great way to give your players like a safe space in the middle mm. of a campaign. But how do you stop all of your taverns feeling like, I don't know, the mono tavern? Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's hard because, you know, for the most part, when you, you know, you have a tavern in your brain, you kind of imagine like a like an old-fashioned English pub kind of tavern, you know, dark oak floors with these rustic wooden tables and I think that's tankers. also because we're British. But yes. <laughs> yes, that's true. But it's common in fantasy too. Yes, but yes, it's, it's 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 that's kind of the thing you have in your brain, and it's used a lot in fantasy books, you know, all over the place. You know, that's what taverns look like. But they don't have to look like that. You know, in a fantasy game where you've got all of these different things going on, it can look very different. You know, a dwarven tavern, I imagine, would look kind of similar, but quite different architecturally. Mead hall! You know, you'd have more of a mead hall, viking aesthetic, maybe. Yeah. Or it might be a little bit different. You might have lava running through it. And, you know, all of these different elements that would make it sort of more industrial and a little bit more interesting to sort of, you know, grab onto people. I mean, it would be cool if you had, like, a dwarven tavern slash blacksmith and it was combined into one thing so you've got sort of that combination the dwarves would do work and pleasure at the same time i don't know they might be cool you, know, you grab but... a drink while you're waiting for the uh the armorer to like bang out all the holes in your armor yeah sure why work, not? right and that's just one example you know if you're thinking about a fantasy world in DD, then there's plenty of different you know elements that you can draw upon elvish taverns and merfolk taverns and all these different halfling taverns all the different races will kind of have their own taverns all the different cultures can have their own taverns that will be different mm -hmm. then you can start interjecting new elements to taverns and combining things so taverns and you know fighting pits and taverns and all of these other like interesting things that you might find in a city or in a town um and that can really help stand make that tavern stand out from just a normal tavern um, yeah absolutely. so yeah i think biomes are another option that people always mm. forget so they have taverns and then you go to a desert and you're like oh it's a tavern in a desert but why is it a tavern why isn't it like cool and refreshing and instead of having a warm fire it's got like constant like a rain waterfall that you can mm. walk through to cool yourself off and this kind of stuff right yeah like, that's definitely true you can really you can really dig into the challenges of the landscape 
mm. to create your tavern as an oasis that solves the problems of the landscape. So if mm. the landscape is cold and sticky, then you'll have a rack for your muddy shoes and a nice warm fire. But if it's hot and sandy and horrible, then, you know, you need different things. Right? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like the idea of a swamp tavern, you know, just having it all on stilts and it being kind of, it's not really that well made. So you kind of get that little like, this kind of thing going on is all the people in the tavern as it sways. sort of sways on the sticks, you know, the waterways below. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. We had a stream, of, um, was it last week? I think it was last week where we talked about uh, taverns with Logan Rees from uh, Runesmith, Z Runesmith. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about having a tavern on chicken legs. I think a tavern on chicken legs in a swamp that is where that lives. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't want a tavern on the ground. You need a tavern on chicken legs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would get you through the swamp. No problem. Well, depending okay. how big the chicken legs are. I mean, well, if like... they're actual chicken legs, not too much. But giant <laughs> chicken legs, I can imagine it would be quite useful. So instead uh... of like one giant pair of chicken legs, it would just be like hundreds of tiny little wading. Oh my God, that's like, that's like, like Lovecraft. That's horrible. <laughs> just imagine it's just like these tiny little... feet underwater, like... Just make like a little that. chittering sound as it walks... Oh, <laughs> oh. Okay, <laughs> we've created horribleness. Let's yeah. move on. <laughs> so... Janet's natural tendency to turn normal, everyday fantasy things into just horrible monsters of I write horror by action. design <laughs> yeah there's a reason that people keep asking me to write disgusting things it's fine it's what i do um <laughs> all right so uh actually that gets us to a really interesting space media games movies mm. what inspires your maps where do you draw inspiration from Elden Ring. apart from my disgusting brain elden ring <laughs> Sorry, I've been obsessed playing that game recently. It's great. But uh, I, I think that that's true. I think, uh, I, you know, I, I read a lot when I was little. I don't read as much as I do now, but um, I read a lot of fantasy when I was little. And, and that's obviously helped form a, a kind of broad background of different things that I can draw upon for ideas. Um, and certainly, I think these days, games especially are great at providing a, a great sort of unique look at different you know, they try, they, games are always trying to like find new spins on things. They don't want to create something tropey because people then won't buy it and won't be interested. It so, looks like something else. Yeah. yeah, it needs to look, you know, as unique as it can while still, you know, satisfying that tropiness of a tavern. So I think games are really, really good for that. You know, you can look at tons of new games that have come out in recent years and you can play through them and, and look at what they do and, and, and they do taverns really well. A lot of spaces really well. But, you know, I think that's games like... Um, the Witcher 3 and uh, Baldur's Gate and and these kind of fantasy tabletop RPG kind of games where they're kind of bordering on that sort of tabletop RPG. They're RPG games, but they're sort of, you could imagine playing in that world if you're, a, you yeah. know, an adventuring party. And I think that's the kind of stuff that you can use as inspiration uh, really easily. Um, but there are other games as well, or, or, or movies and things that maybe are not close, that close to D&D that you can still take inspiration from and change it slightly to fit your world. Um, you know, if, you, if you're watching a movie and something really stands out to you, you know, even if it's, say, like in a cyberpunk, you know, what's the, what's the movie, the Blade Runner movie, and, they, you know, it's got that kind of aesthetic or that kind of vibe that you're going for or something unique about it, change it to fit your fantasy world and bam, you've got something unique. And I think that that can work really well too. Yeah, absolutely. I would say one of the most disappointing things about the Witcher world, which I love, were mm. the taverns, actually. Like, a lot of the taverns yeah. felt all very similar. Mm. Whereas um, if you look at something like Skyrim, which I'm completely obsessed with, mm. every tavern had its own little story. Like, mm. they all had unique names, but and they didn't look that different. But, for example, there was the... the um, the winking skeever that had the little story about why it was called the winking skeever and there was mm. the the one in windhelm with the with the giant candle that never went out and this kind of thing like it can be as simple as that i think mm. you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel with your taverns but giving them a little bit of uniqueness and just like rearranging the floor plan around that uniqueness i think mm. is something that will already make your players go okay this is not just a copy paste yeah i think that's true as well i, I like i said before i mean it's it's quite it's kind of like we're, we're pushing against an, a tide, you know, there's kind of that mm. perception across like, I don't know, our space that having a tavern is autom automatically like, oh, it's boring. Um, but it's not, it's what you have, it's how you make it interesting and you yeah. actually have to put some work into it. I think The Witcher 3 is, has a lot of places in the world that are generic. Um, maybe that's done on purpose, but honestly, it might be just the case that when they were designing that game, they were like, taverns have been done we'll try and do some more interesting things elsewhere 
Um, but I, I, I kind of disagree. I think if you spend time on it and you're trying to make interesting things, you know, around these elements like taverns, they can be really, really great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just looking through to the chat. There's some conversation about how the uh, the tavern on chicken's legs might uh, have children welcome, which is a very sinister and wonderful thought. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what, no. It adds the children's legs to the bottom of the tavern? No, it's because Baba Yaga ate children, right? Oh. Like the Baba really? Yaga lived in the house on chicken's legs. I it's thought a... Baba Yaga just ate everybody. I didn't realize she ate children specifically. I think children are particularly delicious. Oh, right. Gross. Gross. There's a question about this. Which... <laughs> anyway, we, we're getting off track again. Kaoro, we're getting off track again. We do this so easily. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taverns. <laughs> taverns, taverns. Speaking of which, what do people get wrong about taverns? Now, I know that wrong is a very dangerous word when we're talking about art, right? But what do you see in taverns in D&D or in things like The Witcher, for example, that you feel like, oh, it's that was a missed opportunity or, oh, technically that wasn't quite as well done as it could have been, for example? Scale. I think a lot of the time. Uh, the thing about taverns, I, I don't know if this is simply my opinion or the fact that I, I think that this is, you know, a general problem, but I think most of the time taverns just don't get the scale right. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of taverns should feel quite pokey and quite tight and small. Yeah. And you've got to kind of like push your way past the patrons. It's got to have, kind of have that, you know, atmosphere to it it can't be a more modern like a restaurant where you've got space between yeah. tables and you know vaulted oh, ceilings but yeah. and things like that but i think that's probably one of the things i would change a lot like the most about sort of a lot of these taverns that i see in different yeah. media is uh, and battle maps you know they should be quite tight you know that's going to give you a, a better vibe and a better sort of like thing a feeling for a tavern then i think having all of this sort of like grandeur or you know too much gaps between things i think that's another really interesting thing when you'll have a tavern in an urban setting as opposed to a tavern in a rural setting mm -hmm. because a tavern in an urban setting like i was i just made a crack about restaurants in london uh where everything is really tightly packed in but you know space is at a premium in an urban environment particularly if it's a city with walls and everyone's trying to be inside the walls. So yeah, you will have people like almost sitting on top of each other, which mm. also, by the way, can create some really interesting mm. uh, like brawl situations where people are like knocking each other and knocking into each other. But well, then that and being able to hear them behind you. being like, Absolutely. Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you could like, it's, a, it's hard to have a, a private conversation in mm. a London restaurant because you're like almost <laughs> next to somebody else, right? Yeah. It would be the same in an urban tavern. Yeah, exactly. Um, Demetrius has just written raunchy brawl. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to investigate that. No, no, no. Taverns. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then in a, in a rural environment, you know, you might have more space. You might have a more open space with, with a little bit more room, you mm -hmm. know? That's true. So, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So scale is what you reckon people get wrong. Yeah. How big should you make your tavern map itself? So we've talked about the scale inside the tavern. How big should the tavern map be then? I don't know. I think that's a, that's a good question for what you're going to be using it for. Uh, in general, I would say that I'd base it on tables. Like how many tables are you going to have in your, in your uh, tavern? Yeah. I'd say probably like at least five tables. Uh, and then beyond that, it starts to get sort of a little bit, you know, unmanageable. Because you have to remember that when you're trying to play D, D right on a battle map in some kind of program like online or, or in person whatever you're probably going to want to fill that space up with npcs now the problem with that is if you have 10 20 tables you've made this massive tavern and you want to feel you want to feel like it's busy and you know things are happening yeah. and you go in there suddenly group cast and then you've got like a hundred different npcs that's completely unmanageable so <laughs> My advice would be to kind of base that around how many tables you're going to have and how many NPCs you're going to have to run in that tavern. I mean, yes, you could run a big tavern that's kind of empty. It's only got a couple of NPCs, but still, I, my advice would be to make it smaller rather than bigger. Um, and to the end, you know, you should think about adding those uh, elements that I said at the beginning, like the bar and maybe a big fireplace, and maybe a stairs to, you know, go down into a basement where they got beer or whatever. But generally speaking, you want to have a few tables, some of those elements, and that's your tavern. 
Um, unless, of course, you start adding interesting elements. But then you still probably have quite a limited number of tables to play with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, do you suggest two story taverns? And how do you do those in a map? So, yeah, I think that that can be quite cool. Uh, certainly taverns traditionally, you know, taverns slash inns are kind of, you know, the same thing. Um, and having space to go upstairs and rest after you've had a, you know, a drink after you've traveled for three weeks across the wilderness is obviously going to be very appealing to an adventuring party. Uh, so, yes, you, you can absolutely do that. Um, Dimmy saying, take a bath downstairs. Uh, <laughs> I think that's instructions for you later, Kaora. Oh, and then I'm a raunchy roll. What is wrong with Demetrius? He's very spicy today. <laughs> He's uh, very spicy. I, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. Yes, so you can obviously <laughs> have an upstairs with rooms. Uh, you can even have like an upstairs balcony, perhaps with a couple more tables. Yeah. It makes it very interesting to you know, role play the idea of you going upstairs and looking down onto some tables that maybe you want to gossip, like, like hear the gossip or overhear the conversation. Um, and, you know, drawing that kind of thing for the most part is you draw different levels. So you draw one and then you draw an overlay over the top. And that allows you to sort of go between them. If you're playing on, you know, in person, that's as simple as printing out one and printing out the other. So you put one over the other. And if you're playing online, then there's plenty of ways to, to deal with different scenes um, or even different levels. I know Foundry VTT has some great modules that allow you to just click a button and it goes between the two levels. So that's quite cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can also in, uh, create those layers in, in World Anvil, just sort of have mm. just, yeah, just click them on and off. Two players and just, just let your players sort of explore if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. Layers are great. And again, you could even include secret layers, like a secret cellar that mm. the players don't know about until they know about it, that kind of thing. Like it, it can be really fun to play with layers. Mm. Um, and I think it's something that gives a lot of interest to your tavern um, in a very, really a straightforward way. Like particularly if you've done the outside line and you copy it and you just say, okay, this is the same upstairs. And then you just put in different assets. There's a lot that you can do that is like, you've, you've done the basic outline work and then you, just sort of, you know, reskin it for the top level, if you see what mm. I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And let's be honest, like it's probably worth you spending your time on the tavern, right? I mean, yeah. for the most part, you're not gonna be spending your time doing an individual house in the village unless it's yeah. got a murder in it or it's important for some reason. Yeah. But the tavern, you know, is gonna be a meeting hub. You absolutely. know, you're gonna be spending time in there, role-playing time, you know, raunchy brawl time. Uh, it's gonna be like a place that you go to uh, actually, you know, play. So it's worth spending some time to actually work out some details, put in, you know, little elements that might happen later on if when they come back or all this good stuff. Um, it is it is worth doing that for, for a good tavern map. Really interesting thought from Mikara Chandra. Um, you might want to include beds of different sizes for different sized races. It's a very interesting thought. This is something they do in... Um... Well, uh, they have it in the Prancing Pony and Lord of the Rings. They have like special Hobbit beds. Yeah, I always find that weird. Why not just make giant beds? Um, because uh, then I, Hobbits could just you can like throw a few Hobbits, Hobbits, Hobbits to a, bed. In, to a giant bed. You yeah. know, the, the there's four Hobbits. Oh, they only need one bed. <laughs> yeah. They just just put them on a giant bed. We have got a giant. We'll just put him in one bed. This it works. But if they're all tiny beds. Then you're not going to be able to fit a big guy in like a Goliath in like a tiny little hobby bed. You could, no, just push work. all the beds yeah. together and then oh, have I them see. lie the other way. Right. <laughs> there are ways to manage. I guess it depends how bespoke your establishment is, right? If you're like a hyper luxury five star mm. magical tavern, then of course you're going to have the Goliath beds and the tiny, mm. tiny little fairy beds. Um, and you're going to have these sort of bespoke rooms for this glorious experience. If it's like, it's a tavern, mate, you can sleep here or you can sleep in the stables, then it might not. <laughs> we got a bunk bed, it's full of straw. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> We've got a bunk bed. What that means is you can like it or you can bunk it. <laughs> yes. Taverns, Janet. Come on, taverns. taverns. <laughs> oh, man. We are so bad at going in a straight line. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, advice for your first tavern. Beginners attempting a first tavern. I'm sure we have some in the chat. Or maybe even their first at battle map altogether. Where do you suggest that they start? And do you have any other advice for them as well? Yeah, I think... Uh... 
just general advice about starting map making or starting your own, like doing your own maps, look at references, you know, find other battle maps that you like, find other styles that you like, find concept art pictures of taverns that, you know, fit the mood or the style that you want to go for, find something that, you, that connects with you and then start emulating that. You know, if you're you're just starting out, you probably want to start out with a map making program like Dungeon Fog or Dungeon Draft, or whatever they, whatever you have, um, or whatever you can get your hands on. Start to learn the tool, uh, work out the space, and then start to add elements from that reference from those reference images. You know, if you if you find a brilliant, beautiful reference image that has this Our wonderful tavern. For most of us, some of you are scary stuff. You find it full of very. Uh, Demetrius. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess you me. Okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we just started hearing all of the voices in Dimitri's head all at once. Yeah. I thought I was going crazy. Uh, no, no, so... Dimitri's going crazy. Stop doing it on the mic. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really good place to start and a, a great place to sort of center yourself so you know sort of these simple steps that you can start taking. Obviously, making your first map and making your first panel map probably going to be, you know, relatively simple. You know, you, you're going to start off with a wooden floor maybe or a flagstone floor you're going to get four walls and then you're going to start fill it in with fill it in with you know some tables and some chairs and a fireplace and a few mugs on the tables uh maybe a little countertop for some bar stuff that a bartender can sit behind yeah. and that's all you really need to get started and then after you've done that then you can sort of do some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier where you start adding in interesting bits and, and different bits to make it unique, different colors and things like that and different themes and styles and trying to work out which biomes are in and who owns the tavern and you know what races are gonna be there predominantly and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would say, uh, <laughs> you guys know I used to be a musician. The, uh, the, musicians, the musicians in the 18th century, there we go, uh, used to copy out works of other people in order to learn them mm. and i would say as an artist it's not bad to copy other people's work when you're starting out mm -hmm. just to get a feel for what they've done to start out you know it doesn't have to be the most original most beautiful thing when you start you can get somebody else's map and say right how do i go about recreating this one before you start recreating the more intangible things that are in your in your own head right yeah absolutely like I think one of the reasons I got so good with color was because I was painting Warhammer models. I wasn't designing Warhammer models and, you know, sort of sculpting all these beautiful, like, you know, characters and, and monsters. I was literally learning color theory and how to do all this kind of stuff. So do the same thing, you know, start with a template or sort of copy this, the, the rough outline or, or look at something, look at a blueprint and be like, right, I'm going to copy that directly but then I'm going to add in my own assets or change things around a bit. And that gives you so much, you know, starting like framework to, to build something on top of. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always worth reminding people. You do not have to start from zero. You do not have to start from absolute scratch. Mm. You can start with some work that somebody else has done. It's the same way, you know, when you start plotting a novel, you don't start from nothing. You pick up a plot structure and you say, right, all right, We've done this before. We know how this goes. I'm not starting from zero. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's very easy to feel like the yawning chasm of your own inexperience when you start something. Yeah, it can <laughs> but, be really daunting, yeah. but it's it, it it can be overcome by by stealing voraciously from whatever source you can, because yeah. eventually as you tweak it and, and smash it against the wall to make it your own, it's going to become your own. Um, yeah. And that's totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some love for that idea in the chat. ECC Books says, I second that suggestion of Janet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for agreeing with me. Learning from the masters is the way to go. Take something you love, see how they did it, and you'll learn how to do it yourself. Um, same goes, according to Surian for French prose. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it's a great way to start learning, is to start with what somebody else has done that you admire and um, pick it apart, figure out why it works. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> So you've mentioned already some of the assets that you should consider in your tavern map, the a mm. bar and some chairs. What assets do you typically use in a tavern map? Uh, I think a lot of those. I think that the other thing you need to think about when you, you I mean, those are the basics, right? You're always going to find those things in a tavern, at least in part or in some form or another. Whether or not that table is going to be a normal table that you might find like a wooden sort of 
post table or it's something more you know elaborate or, or a mimic but uh, generally speaking <laughs> you you're going to find those kind of things but then you need to think about what other things you might find something sometimes you can find more like luxurious items you know like rugs and fur pelts and and things on the walls like you know uh mounted animal heads and you know banners and weapons and shields and all of these different things that make that tavern feel like a I don't know sometimes taverns can really feel like the meeting place for a village or a town or a city district you know where everybody sort of brings their shared experiences and they might bring back trophies or you know all of these uh somebody might have their own table in the corner you know like a certain group or a couple of people who always come to that tavern and over the years they've they've bought their own unique table and their own chairs and they've had the upholstery done differently and you know they've got different you know they've got more uniqueness to that area or that space in a tavern and that's the kind of thing that you can start to delve into you know how how can we really make this tavern feel more like it's been lived in and it's had all these shared experiences over you know years and years and years maybe different owners and things like that because you got to remember taverns a lot of the time not just meeting places they're quite old you know they're always in the the, the, the places that are almost always the first things to be built in a town or village you know people always congregate there for events or for you know after the hard days work in the fields or in the mines or whatever it is so generally speaking it's going to be around forever and it's going to collect all this tut and stuff in the corners or you know i can imagine like a few priceless artifacts you know like a, a thing somebody's found and chucked in the corner it's just holding umbrellas or canes or something um that's all very common in english pubs uh, <laughs> just random antiques that you could put on an antique market and you'll be worth yeah, where someone's just like scruffled through a secondhand shop or something yeah and and i think that that is, can really bring a tavern uh, to life yeah absolutely bonnie juju says don't forget the graffiti and such that such that patreon scratch onto the whipped tables and walls yes absolutely mm -hmm. yeah um, uh yeah a little bit harder to show some of that stuff on a battle map how would you how would you approach that i think that it is and it isn't i mean obviously anything that you see from top down can be done uh doing stuff from walls you know like like i said about like trophies and, and banners and things like that that can be trickier uh because the perspective is usually top down so you're not being able to see the wall you know you're not gonna be able to see a painting for example which might be on a wall which is something else you might find um but there are things that you can use to sort of signify this kind of thing standing out. And you can sometimes get away with doing a little bit of perspective as well, where you've got something that's just slightly coming out from the wall. So you can just, just about see what it is. And then that gives you the point where you can say to a player or to you know the, the adventuring party, that's where the painting is, or that's where the banner is, or that's where the trophy of the dragon head is, because that's going to be something that they will you know look at and look at on the map as well, because yeah it's basically a battle map is a reference sheet for the players they want to be able to see where things are in relation to the characters and you can do that with pretty much everything though some things like that are harder than others yeah absolutely so i'm glad that you brought up brought that up the the map is a, as a reference system before your your players does the system that you're playing affect how you make your tavern it can do yeah i mean for the most part like Traditional D and D and Pathfinder and many others have this kind of grid style thing where it's like a five foot grid, and I, I make all of my stuff to that you know scale because obviously that's the most common and the one that people use the most. But you can have other systems whether you different scales or you might want to have a different scale yourself because you might want to have a bigger space. Let's just say you're making a battle map that's massive, but you've changed the scale slightly, so it's a little bit more manageable to create that battle map that's fine but then it makes the asset smaller and it does all this kind of weird stuff and you have to kind of you know try and manage that uh in a in a good way so yeah i think that that's true and i think that for me um you know just paying attention to you know where things are in relation to another and what looks good next to another asset if you have a take if you have one asset to start with like a table just make sure everything kind of fits around that table. You kind of yeah. know how big a table is. Um, so when you put the mug on it, it's not 10 times the size. It's like just a mug over the table. You know, it's gonna be a smaller object on the table. Yeah. And you're gonna have a chair that's actually going under the table and it's not like, you know, like a tiny little chair that you've got you just slide under the table. Um, so it's all about scale and getting things looking right in relation to other parts of the map. 
um, that's quite important. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you've talked about this before that you make your assets on a slightly more heroic scale as well, right? Mm, that's true. Yeah, I, I think that for me, I, I don't really think that, you know, you have to be super accurate. You don't have to look at a battle map and say, in real life, this chair would be 31 centimeters long on the armrest. You know, the armrest would be 30 centimeters long. So how big would that be in scale? It's not about that. It's I should to... draw it 1.27 <laughs> millimeters with my tiny, tiny pencil. Yeah, it, it just it, it it just gets too much. Instead, you have to look, do what I like what I said before, which is find how what your sort of scale is, and then have everything referenced around it so that it looks like it belongs. Um, and that works a lot better. And certainly some objects can appear slightly bigger than they really would be. Certainly you can have your mug sitting on a table in a battle map looking a little bit bigger than they would do in real life, just, just so, so you can see them. Discernible, yeah. yeah. And same with coins or any small little dice bits or cards or anything that you might have on your battle map that's kind of teeny tiny in real life, but you might want to have them being a little bit more obvious just make them slightly bigger, just so they're a little bit more readable. That actually brings me really nicely to my next point, which is about how can you visually show plot hooks and mm. interactables in your tavern? So we make these taverns and uh, I don't know about you, but I love I love giving my players lots of options. I love so, okay, you can you can arm wrestle over here, or there's a darts mm. board, or you know you can play get you can play a, a, a dice game, or or mm -hmm. you know there's a there's a place over here where there's a fish in a tank, and you can go and knock on the glass or whatever, right? <laughs> I love giving my players little bits that they can go and poke and prod and leave as they can pull because do you know what that's what players love to do anyway? Um, how or actually on the other hand like there's an actual plot hook that you actually want your players to notice mm. like there is the letter that you're looking for right here in the office mm -hmm. um or i need you to notice this thing because this is important for the campaign right like there's there's the sort of three three kinds of things you might want your players to notice how do you how do you point those up how do you show those things in a talent i think that's a that's a general question for for battle map, battle maps, sort of, yeah, yeah, more like you know, how do you how do you make your battle map so that you can focus the attention of your players onto the areas that you want their attention focused on? And I think there's a tr there is a trick to it, and I think that one of the things I like to do is play a little bit with um, people like to focus um, on things that are in vision, yeah. Um, but also they like to focus on things that are that stand out. And this is a kind of like little visual trick, but let's imagine that you had a square room, right? Has no lighting, mm. right? And it's the same color and you place objects all around the room, right? Now, it, when you do that, there's no, no object is gonna stand out from any other object. No object right? is because, more important than another vision. Because yeah. everything could potentially be something relevant. Instead, if you put a table in the middle and an object or an object in the middle of the room or somewhere in the middle-ish, right? And you put everything else in the room in shadow, right? So you've got just the light just in the middle of the room and that object is highlighted, right? Then immediately that's more important than anything else that's kind of faded out because that's been deliberately done, right? So immediately that's something that the player is gonna try and like grab onto. You can do the same sort of trick with saturation as well. If everything is slightly grayed out around that, and that thing is a little bit more saturated and, and you know, a little bit more obvious. Yeah. That can definitely be something that the players will focus in on and try and interact with. Really interesting. So lighting, saturation, size, I'm guessing as well. Yeah, that's true. Although sometimes you can have a little gem, you know, a little, little bright purple gem in the middle of a very drab nice. environment. Uh, that can actually be something really, really like, whoa, engaging and interesting to a player. They're like, whoa. Bubble. Ah. I love that. I love that as an idea. And um, yeah, like finding, like having these tips for like how to get your players to hone in on something. I think that's, mm. that's, that's so valuable. Do you have any more other little nuggets like that for us? <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh, I, uh, generally, that's a good idea for any kind of map, though. You know, you definitely want to have like lighting be a big focus of, of how you're going to set the tone and the mood of a map. You know, when we've been talking about making battle maps today, uh, we haven't really talk, talked about any of the final touches that you might want to do on your map, but lighting is pretty important and it can really set the tone and the vibe of your map. 
you know, warm colors, you know, fiery colors that are coming from candles or fireplaces and things like that are wonderful for setting that warm, cozy feeling. Um, but like just the, the opposite, you know, changing the color of the lighting can instantly change the tone. If you walk into a tavern and it's warm and cozy and got orange lights and reddish lights from fires, it can be completely different if you walk into a tavern, and it's got bluish lights and cyany lights and it's like, oh, spirits and undead and oh, creepy. It's, oh, I don't like it in here. What's going on? Uh, immediately that can be so, so different and that can really change the tavern. You can have like the same tavern, but you can change the lighting and it's different. Um, and you could use that for different encounters over multiple sessions. Yeah, I think that's so clever. And again, not just with the lighting and the color scheme of the lighting, you can dig into the colors of the wood. Is it like airy mm. white pine or is it dark and, and thickly cut? the oak mm. right like like really digging into these sort of um i mean i always say the five, the five senses right is a great place to, to jump off but color is is so important in the way that we understand uh sort of mood and tone we mm -hmm. we literally say grim dark right we mm. we use dark in that um so yeah thinking about thinking about hues and tones and color palettes i think is something that that will convey a lot to your players Mm. immediately they will look at the thing and make snap judgments and you can use those snap judgments or you can subvert those snap judgments yeah and, that, and uh, let's be honest i mean it can be hard to do when you're just starting out like mm. that might feel like something completely foreign to somebody who's trying to do battle mapping or any art for like starting out it's like oh how do i change the tone you know i don't even know what tone is but you definitely get into it like a you start to learn more about that the more reference art that you look at the more you understand how color palettes sort of interact and what yeah. what colors work with one another that's not something that you're ever going to get starting out right yeah. don't worry about that that comes with time and practice and you know doing more maps or doing more artwork um it's it, it, it can be tough but don't worry you're not supposed to know all of that stuff right off the bat uh and no one expects you to um but it is something that can help quite a lot down the line when you're starting to do like your 10th map or your 50th map or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you make good maps if you're not artistically inclined? We've talked a lot about beginners. <laughs> I myself have the artistic skills of a concussed potato. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be listening carefully to the answer on this one. So are we assuming that the potatoes are sentient because you've can concussed be. the brain? Only if you're a star potato. Star potatoes um... are sentient. The, the, well, the Anvil Crew knows what I'm talking about. There's a song and everything. Don't worry about right. it. the whole okay. thing. Sorry, taverns. Uh, <laughs> so we. <laughs> so, what was the question? Uh, how do you start up? <laughs> God, how do you make good maps if you're not artistically inclined? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, there's a great philosophy. Uh, well, a different philosophy. The chat than mine. is now singing the song. In case you wondered. Go so. Ahead. There's a different philosophy to mine, which D and D, like the official Wizards of the Coast, hold that I I challenge, which is that you don't need a good, beautiful, coloured map to play D and D, right? In, in in basic terms, their philosophy is that you need uh, a piece of paper and a pen, and you need four walls, and you need little icons, and that's yeah. all you need to play D and D. And they're kind of right in some respects, uh, especially if you're playing at the table and you're doing a little bit more theater of the mind and you're a little bit more, you know, descriptively minded, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, talk about and, you know, come up with all these sort of different descriptions and things of, of the areas and the, and the places that they're in, that's fine. In the modern world, however, uh, where we're mostly playing online, uh, or a lot of us are, Battle maps can be very useful tools to bring people together and to show off much more interesting and in-depth areas of your world. And you kind of want to have color and detail and little bits that you want to explore. And that's kind of where you need to start heading. Like, I would say that if you're just starting out and you're not artistically minded, there's nothing wrong with a piece of paper or a blank canvas and black and white stuff perfectly fine you know that's there's nothing wrong with it it's going to help you run your game and that's the main purpose of it but after that you then might want to think about making some some maps in different programs you know that will help you do some of these things i mean when i make my maps i make them in photoshop from scratch and i'm like drawing all the line art and i'm you know individually yeah, coloring all these you're things a professional illustrator because i'm a professional but you're, you don't want to do that. You, you, you don't have the time or the, you know, the, 
the years of knowledge or you know the the you know whatever so definitely one of the things you can do is skip a lot of that process and find assets to use that you can just slap down on top of other like textures you know like a wood floor that can immediately make you something visually impressive without you having to actually draw anything the only thing you really need to figure out is how you can uh you know put the things together you know um and there's some great tools out there you know like dungeon fog does a great job um of of doing that you know there's there's tons of stuff i mean you've got a blog on world anvil that talks about the great map making tools that you can use uh right. so definitely check that out if you want to have like a list of all the ones that you can choose because there's pros and cons to a lot of different ones um but yeah i mean that, that's my best advice you don't necessarily have to be at all artistically inclined as long as you understand some of the principles and the design elements about you know where to put things and you know how spaces are set up and looking at blueprints and all this kind of stuff for buildings and dungeons and, and that kind of thing yeah i mean i will say that um i as i say artistic ability of a concussed potato i am not visually inclined as a human like give me sounds and words any day i am there but visuals are not my strong suit but um yeah this is not product placement by the way but um i use dungeon fog i know a lot of people use other software uh dimitris likes incarnate right now um mm. but essentially even for me who has no skill being able to go onto a program like this and just mash something out it looks so much better than what i would be able to draw freehand and even though it doesn't look as beautiful as one of your maps or even one of dimmy's maps because you know dimmy is an artist and a trained designer and i am but as we mentioned concussed potato um it still gives the feel it still gives the impression and um yeah if you don't want to dig into making things freehand it's a great way to go i would say and um yeah a lot of these programs have free versions so you can do a lot just for free without shelling out for a program yeah that's 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 true yeah. and there's that weird thing that, that they started talking about recently how some people are able to view more colors or more like yeah. parts of the spectrum than other people and i might have that which makes my art more vibrant and somebody like janet who's you know artistically um you know not so talented um she says but she's fine uh you know it, it might struggle more so you don't have to be expected to literally like you know design and create these beautiful spaces for you to play on every single time for your games because a lot of the time that's just too much work anyway you know all yeah. you really need to do is have a combination at least in my mind you have to have a combination between the official D&D &D philosophy which is just the you know the space yeah and then trying to make it a little bit more visually appealing for playing online and giving you a little bit more options uh, yeah. and that can be accomplished with some of these programs yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you want to go the D&D &D route, why not have a great picture of a tavern? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. you can your map can be very bare bones, but you can have a picture to help your players visualize because yeah, that's what it's, be that's what we're talking about. After all, mm. right? we're talking about helping your players understand this space and yeah. what you envisage what you're trying to convey with that space. Yeah. And you, and you always you almost always need a battle map, whether or not you see. The thing is, is that people who say, oh, I play theater of the mind. It's like, yeah yeah all right you probably still always need gonna, are gonna the dm's gonna have some kind of rough sketch in their notebook of the space yeah even if they never show that to the players they're gonna need a reference of the space to know how far away that goblin is from the player you know is it 30 feet is it 40 feet is it 60 yeah. feet that's quite important in DD. so maps generally speaking are almost necessary um for playing it's just you know how much effort you want to go into into you know like making it a uh, visually stunning um and most of the time it doesn't have to be visually stunning and if it does why not check out kaora's assets they're really pretty <laughs> yes <laughs> use, use my stuff uh plug <laughs> <coughs> kaora.com uh, just to remind you all, actually, while we are talking about Kira's absolutely exquisite assets, we are raffling off a couple of packets, two packets of the rustic furniture assets, which would be great for your tavern, just saying. Uh, exclamation point raffle to take part in that. Kira, we have my final question, and then it's on to the audience questions. How do you know when your tavern map is done? Uh, never. Never done. It's never done. You'll always be working. No, it's... You stop working on it... Um... Just before you have to start playing. This, no, was, uh, this was my answer. My answer is when your I session stole it. is starting. I stole it. 
I don't have when an your session that. is starting, your map is done. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. I always feel like when I'm designing maps, um, that I kind of just keep working to, on them until I'm sick of them. Um, and I think that's probably true for almost everybody. You work on them as much as you can, like stomach working on them. Uh, because there's always things you want to add. There's always things you want to try and like improve or make different. I was like, oh God, that doesn't look right. Why don't I add things over there? So yeah, generally speaking, you always have to give yourself self-imposed time limits. You have to work out, oh, well, I've only got a couple of hours until the game. I'll spend some time on this, but that's that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I guess it's a bit subjective and it depends on what you're, like who you are and you know how you design things and how you make things. Um, but generally think about, you know, is it going to be useful to play on? If it is, all you're really doing is polishing and you could polish forever. So yeah. make sure you don't, you know, overwhelm yourself with spending three weeks making one tavern map yeah. and then the players don't even go to the tavern. Yeah. That would hurt a lot. <laughs> so yeah, uh, self-imposed time limits, uh, of, your ability to design and make things um, is probably a good idea. If that ever happens to you, put your tavern on chicken legs and then have it walk to the players. Follow them around. <laughs> Tiny duck legs. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're they walking it down the road. They didn't go into that tavern. They're walking down the road and then they turn around. The, tav the tavern's behind us still, but we've been yeah, walking I for just, three I hours. I have this like, Pink Panther music in my head. <laughs> She's following that them. Bottom. Put em, put em, put em, put em. Yep. That take, takes put it a little em. bit less creepy and more <laughs> sort of like, you know, sort of joyfully, you know, just like did it, did it. But yeah, it's it's still pretty oh creepy. My goodness. So when I asked Andy Law that question, how do you know when a map is done? He told me when the deadline rolls around, which is very similar to what, what you said as well. Yeah, I think the yeah. the big takeaway here is don't obsess. Don't don't mm. let the tavern map control you. Um, and uh, yeah, like if it's not giving you joy anymore, then just say, OK, thank you very much for the experience. I've worked on this. My players will enjoy it. And the next one will be better and different and new and another project. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a wonderful thing. I can't remember exactly how it goes now, where it's like you, you go through stages of emotion when you're designing yeah. a project. You know, you go through the, you know, like the stages of grief, but the stages yeah. of design where you just get like happy and then you get excited and then you get sort of, okay, just buckle down. And then you start hating it and then you start to fear it. And then you're like, I'm done with this. And that's when you stop <laughs> because you're done with it. Um, this happens with novels too. In case yeah, you yeah, it's a, it's, it's universal so for creative work. But I, I think that, you know, that that's a good, that's a good thing to think about. You know, when you're done with it, you know, you're done with it. Yeah. Um, all right, we have some audience questions here. Let's have a look. Let's kick off with what methods, methods would you use to deliver the history of a tavern to the players. Uh, for example, like the mechanical dinosaur hanging from the roof in the Hunter's Lodge in Horizon Zero Dawn. This is a question mm. from Good Villain. It's a good question. Yeah, well, again, that's, that's going to uh, probably boil down to what, what you have in the tavern to, to show off that age, right? Um, and you also have to think about what do old taverns look like? What would, what would something old look like in a tavern? um you know are you going to be able to design this with a kind of like that that in mind think about an old tavern you're probably going to have beams and things that are all like chipped um and scuffed as people walk past them or scratched or damaged from previous raunchy brawls uh and things like that and if you want to have elements of the assets that that show off the history of the area so maybe at one point there was a battle are there going to be tons of like old swords and, and armors and things that are kind of littered around the, the tavern to show off some, some you know, famous fighters or, 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 or just the, the soldiers that were fighting in that war? Um, that all boils down to what's going on in your world and what you can incorporate into the design. And that's all about the thinking. You know, you have to think about the design and the, the place that you're going to be sort of creating on your map. And then you can start to incorporate those elements as best you can. Um, so yeah, that's that's a that's my answer. You you basically have to think about the history and then what you can add to show that history. Um, in Horizon Hero Dawn, having that that stuff over the fireplace, you know, obviously really cool. But you can apply that to to anything. You know, it's that show there's... don't tell 
method, isn't it? Exactly. You know, if you're in a swamp, then you've got like an ancient hydra skull over the top of the thing. You know, immediately that's a that's a, a conversation piece. It's like, what's that? That's the hydra skull that attacked the village, you know, 30 years ago. Um, we've and, we eradicated and now the, the tavern hydras. is called the hydrate. Hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know that that could be the plot point of a new quest or a new like thing. You know, oh, the, the hydras are gone, but they're back. You've got to go kill them, <gasps> baby hydras. Yeah, baby hydras. They always come back, damn hydras. Uh, so yeah, that that could be that could be the possibilities are endless there. But you definitely have to think about you know the the stuff going on around the tavern and what you can mush into it. To, yeah, to absolutely. It or you can go the rule of cool route. So you can say, I want to have this because it's freaking cool. I want to have a dinosaur on top of the tavern because I need a dinosaur tavern. And now let's think of a reason in the history that that is there. Yeah, like maybe you go walk into a tavern that's got a triceratops skull over the mountain, yeah. ma- uh, like the, the mantelpiece. You walk in there and the tavern keeper's like, yes, we found this dino- this uh, this dragon skull. You're like, that doesn't look like a dragon skull. Where did you get that? It's like, oh, it's in the, the cavern, like three miles from the tavern. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, okay. And, that's... and you got a lost world quest. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's there's different ways to do it. There's different ways from, from the perception, but really it's all about show, don't tell. It's mm-hmm. all about, you know, thinking of a great way to showcase visually what you want, the information you want to convey. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's hop on to Sailing Ocelot uh, has a question on the same uh, topic, which is what in- existing story of a made up tavern has been the most fascinating to you? Uh-huh. Favorite tavern <laughs> lore, basically. Favorite tavern lore. I think one of the ones that's really uh, iconic to me. I don't know if this is my favorite, but it's the one that springs to mind. And this is the, the map that I made um, most recently, which is the, the uh, oh, what's the name of it? I called mine the Howling Deep Tavern, which is because it's the Yawning Portal. Hole. The Yawning Portal. That was going to be mine as well, funnily yeah. enough. Because, yeah. and I'm not saying that, that it, it, it's just the one that's, that springs to mind because it's D&D and it's official and it's got a really good premise and a really good idea, right? not necessarily the one that I might think of if I had a little bit more time, but on the spot, that immediately jumps into my brain because it's a great idea, you it's know? It's so unique, yeah. It's, you've got a great big hole in the middle of a tavern that goes down into a mega dungeon. You've yeah. got, like, all the tavern people in the thing, all adventurers that go in and out of the, the mega dungeon. It's great. It fits D&D perfectly. It's, like, yeah. almost, like, perfect design in a way. Um, so I think that that is, is incredibly iconic to me and certainly something that I would like to try and emulate if I was to make taverns in uh, in my worlds is how you could make something that iconically like oh wow that fits you know that's like fantastically you know well built and like thought out and it just works yeah. Um, so yeah I like that yeah absolutely so essentially if you have a mega dungeon you're going to have a lot of adventurers there going in and out so it's the perfect place to have a tavern right yeah. um so funnily enough the yawning portal was another one where you know the first time i heard about it i was like <laughs> i'm so mad i didn't think of that yeah. because it's so cool um so yeah that was the one that came to me um i mentioned earlier of course the the small uh little pieces of lore in skyrim about the taverns mm. and they're so insignificant they're so little but i still remember them mm. you know i still remember oh yes that tavern was the one that had the ever burning candle and that tavern was mm. the one that had the guy with a pet skeever and that tavern was the one where the guy went hunting and got shot in the bum by his brother baxton um and uh, you know these tiny little bits of lore it doesn't even matter in a way what the lore is attaching a story to something gives it narrative and makes it memorable yep it's very true so yeah i would i would always recommend that if if in doubt add a little story and make it either funny or scandalous or super cool (laughs) uh question from secondhand about food of course Secondhand, Mm. big proponent of culinary world building signature dishes or menus and taverns do you think cuisine is a good way to set tone and bring players to the uh bring in the players to buy in Uh, do you find it (laughs) <laughs> do you find it might be a good way to have callbacks and attachments as characters get favorite dishes so that's kind of answered his own question there in that question um but i will say mark did used to be a chef in another iteration of his life so uh mark what are your thoughts culinary world building in taverns yes off to uh, back to you janet <laughs> 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 no uh <clears throat> so 
yes, obviously, uh, we didn't talk about this much, actually. Uh, taverns having kitchens is wonderful. Um, being able to serve food is a great idea for setting the tone and the feel and the vibe for a tavern as well. Uh, obviously, we probably overlooked that a little bit because it's quite important. Uh, but it's, it's, it's obviously something that I think that you can do, spend a lot of time in and make some really cool, like, ideas and sort of put yeah. some bits and pieces together and, and really make it really cool because when you think about it like you could have a tavern that just has a terrible cook you know they serve watery gruel and it's horrible food and you're like oh it's disgusting that's kind of you know interesting you know important it's got that, and memorable yeah it's important memorable good role playing you know just you know it's it's great likewise if you have a, a tavern with wonderful food you know that you're Good, descri- good at describing it and it's got like all these different ingredients you're like oh man that's making me really hungry i love this and then they come back the next time and like i want that thing and they're like you've immediately you've built that connection and interest and, it's and ex- great. expectation exactly so i think that you can do that really easily in a tavern with food i think that probably more than than other things but alcohol you know beer booze drinks you sell that in a tavern have some fun with that come up with some different wines and and needs and all these different sort of things you know if the tavern is famous for its ciders you know and and stuff like that from the local orchard then obviously having that kind of stuff be a memorable part of the identity of that tavern is going to make people remember it and make your players want to go back or you know remember it fondly in their travels into the shadowlands where there's nothing but dry dust uh sorry <laughs> you're talking about <laughs> you know what I mean. there aren't you <laughs> oh, oh, no no <laughs> i would say even further uh if you're we've been talking about show to tell we've been talking about culinary do you know what let's put them together ow mm. i keep doing that i broke my hand um uh, uh, yeah i fell over it's entirely my own fault anyway um so world building is food and food is world building so if you have apple orchards that are creating all of the cider you have apple orchards that's world building guys if -hmm. you're in a super high magic world why is the food not magic give me one good reason why is the stew not giving you plus two constitution why are there not magic cocktails that make you super charismatic for the evening i would buy those i would buy those um so if you're very very high magic then make the food high magic if you're mm-hmm. you bringing in mystical ingredients then those should be around the tavern or available or available from far off and then that's world building as well because you've just created a place where this thing comes from i have so a question you... i have a i have a proposition for you janet tell me could you create a chain of restaurants that spread out across a kingdom with one hydra you just cut off the heads and just chop the neck into like steaks and then yeah, it grows a uh, new head and then you well you, <laughs> you know that actually the neck part is always really good for stew mm. right there is nothing like neck of lamb that's what you stew there is nothing more um more fantasy than a stew so yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see this working you could make like the the mcdonald's or the burger king of a fantasy oh what realm God. just with one hydra just chained somewhere in a basement is that a quest is that cruel i hate hydras but maybe maybe that's <laughs> Maybe rescuing is, the Hydra is something that you want to do. What is cruel is the fact that I'm going to die and you just keep putting up more food. That is cruel. <laughs> I don't know if they can hear you, but Dimitris yeah. has just given is us very a veto hungry. about talking about food. Yeah, steaks, so, um, steaks, ribs, uh, chips, uh, gorgeous gyros. Um, what else does Dimi like? Uh, just... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I'm very close. I'm gonna get like I'm gonna lose a leg if I <laughs> start talking about food. Ah. <laughs> All right, let's look for a final question. Um, and uh, yeah, we have one here. We've already talked a little bit about things people forget to put in a tavern that are important. We've mentioned kitchens. Mm. Anything else? I don't I know. I've probably forgotten them. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, it's beds. A lot of people forget that there should be beds. And then the players are like, oh, can we sleep here? And they're like, yes, go to the beds. Mm. And they're like, oh, great, there were beds. We had no idea. Yeah, I think that's that's true. I think the other, the other thing that I think sometimes is, is often not really well sort of like thought about is storage. Mm. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about basements and what, you know, you might have beer kegs and things like that, but you're probably also going to have places where you're going to store things like bed linens and, you know, foodstuffs and, extra cups and maybe an extra table or two or chairs because they break them during the brawls and things like that 
um, that can be an interesting space, you know, where you can have all this, like, tons of sh shelving and boxes and, and storage things for the tavern that, you know, that, that can be where they've hidden something or, or where you can go to find or talk to the NPC secretly about the mission, you know, so that kind of stuff is something that I think you kind of forget quite easily when you're designing a tavern beyond yeah. the obvious. Yeah. The obvious being, according to chat, toilets. Yeah, well, <laughs> toilets, Taylor obviously. McFergus and Kintai42 say toilets. The first question should always be, where is the toilet and how does it work? Yeah, I, I don't really, I gloss over the uh, that aspect of role playing. In toilets a lot of my don't campaigns. exist in cinema. Yeah, because, you know, pooping and stuff in D&D in &D is kind of like, uh, sure, but it's pretty, probably pretty gross in a fantasy world unless you're living in a higher magic tech society. Yeah. It's just a hole in the ground. But, there is um, a lack of magical poop in yeah. the D&D world. You know, yeah. wombats poop in cubes. There should yeah. be more stuff like that. Yeah. I imagine some races, maybe poop little pellets or something like that. Little, yeah. Mm. We Tavins, should talk about poop. Tavins. Yes, Tavins. <laughs> Tavins. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I think that's all we've got time for. We definitely managed to talk about Tavins a little bit. Um, and I can see that Secreliates one hour um raffle as well so sacrilegies please email me hello at worldanvil.com we will get that prize to you kaora anything new coming up you want to tell us about just before we say goodbye i did just release one of the new things i've been working on for a while now which is a token card for unique oh, creatures it's i'm so super cool, excited guys. about uh i don't know if i can say his name on stream uh but his name uh is really funny and i love it and he's a little goblin merchant extraordinaire and you can check it out on my Patreon and on my Discord. The card itself, that you can find the token and all the stats to play D&D 5th Edition is free and they will all be free. Uh, but if you want the little uh, token to play digitally, like if you want the little transparent PNG to move around in your space, uh, you have to be a certain tier on my Patreon. Um, but apart from that, I think that the idea is really, really awesome and I love making little cool characters. So uh, that's really cool. Yay! Well, folks, thank you so much for tuning in today. Tomorrow we will be live over on our Discord with our stage about Elden Ring lore. Just saying how it can inspire your. Yes, you can come join us if you are Kira. How it can I know inspire all the your... lore. <laughs> well, maybe we can hook you up with tomorrow. Or you can come be a guest on tomorrow's stream. What do you reckon? <laughs> Just, it's Kira week, guys. Kira week. I'll talk about the law for six hours. You got six hours? We, we can do it now if you want. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Sunday. No, Sunday. no, now. We've got to do it now. <laughs> I fucking love that game. Uh, <clears throat> so sorry, that will be on. going live tomorrow at the same time that this stream went live. And uh, yeah, tune in next week for um, some more Trash My Map, some community streams, some more streams as well. One of one of our streams is called You Meet and Our Tavern. So we're going to be talking about the character of buildings and uh, yeah, more good stuff. So folks, we are, I assume going on a raid just before we do i would like to thank you all for coming to join us um i'm just checking through my notes here checking thank you for having me janet here. it was lovely thank you oh hey Aura, it is always such such a pleasure to come and talk to you for you to come and talk to us and i would say that's obvious by the fact that we got like dragged off topic so many times <laughs> yes uh, can't help it can't help it uh, somebody mentioned in the chat we should just have a stream of kaora and janet and dimmy just like playing D D and chatting <laughs> yeah we should that would be fun just, i think we could probably do that very easily for like i think so five too hours, many or hours. Something. too many yeah. hours we always end up talking about food though and dimmy dimmy would rebel yeah that's yeah, true yeah, we do. it happens <laughs> All right, I would like to thank maybe Stuart Auto Artist, Laura Bones, Mikaro Chandra, Baron, Drunken Panda, and all of you for being here today with us. Oh, and Alex Hendy and Not Grey Blood. We are going on a raid, so shout out, light up the forge when we get there to let them know that we sent you. I would like to wish you all the very happiest of time zones and encourage you to grab your hammer and go world builds and make some tavern maps. <laughs> <laughs>